On the first page of his memoirs, Charles de Gaulle wrote, All my life I have thought of France in a certain way. To my mind, France cannot be France without greatness. In the late summer of 1944, when Paris was liberated from four years of German occupation, de Gaulle had identified France's greatness with his own person. Out of the wreck of defeat, he had salvaged France's honor. Through the force of character alone, he had made France great again. For de Gaulle, victory in France marked the end of four years of unremitting struggle against others. Against other French officers who were seniors in the army, against those Frenchmen who had collaborated in France's humiliation in 1940, against other leaders like Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin, who were elders in the art of politics. Yet four years before, de Gaulle's name was unknown, except to a few military specialists who shared his views on modern warfare. Among those who saw de Gaulle's potential in those early days was Drew Middleton of the New York Times. His interest, I think, was in a power system in France that would ensure some sort of stability for the future. He was not uh, at all enamored of what most Frenchmen like, the give and take of four or five parties. What he was really after, and although I think he never admitted it, was a two-party system as in the United States and the United Kingdom that ensured some stability. Uh, he felt there was a lack of control in their system, that uh, they, they were always being turned upside down. But when the Nazi danger arose on the Eastern frontier, then he felt France was in danger, and he would do anything to support the government that they had of the day. On May 10, 1940, after months of phony war, the German armies attacked Holland and Belgium and fell upon France with a massive concentration of armor and artillery supported by dive bombers and parachutists. The Germans called it the Blitzkrieg. This new kind of mobile warfare was exactly what de Gaulle had been advocating in pre-war years. But the French high command were committed to the defensive strategy of the Maginot Line and were quite unprepared for the speed of the German onslaught. De Gaulle had recently been promoted to the command of a tank division. Counterattacking in the north, he scored one of the few French successes of the campaign for which he was decorated the fifth citation for valor of his military career. As the Germans raced for the channel ports, driving Britain's expeditionary force into the sea at Dunkirk, de Gaulle was pulled out of the front and made undersecretary for war. It was his first taste of political power. For de Gaulle personally, it changed everything. 
since he now had legitimate grounds for his future actions. The French people offered little resistance to the invader. They were already weakened by the troubles of pre-war years. Many even welcomed Germany's supremacy in Europe as a bulwark against communism. Paris was declared an open city and the government of which de Gaulle was now a member fled southwards to be replaced by a new government which was ready to make peace with the Germans and collaborate with Hitler's Third Reich. Known as the Vichy government, this new regime was headed by the aged Marshal Pétain, a hero of the First World War. While Germany controlled the continent of Europe, the Vichy government was upheld as the legal authority inside France. In this, the darkest hour of French history, a lone figure spoke out against the Vichy regime. From London, where the British offered him their support, de Gaulle appealed to his fellow countrymen to continue the fight against the Nazis and all who collaborated with them. Nous croyons que l'honneur des Français consiste à continuer la guerre aux côtés de leurs alliés et nous sommes résolus à le faire. Nous espérons qu'un jour, une force mécanique supérieure nous permettra d'avoir la victoire et de délivrer la patrie. The free French, as they were then called, had nothing as far as troops or ships or aircraft. But they were living on a pittance in arms that the British gave them. And he knew this. And he also knew, because he was a good soldier, just how bad the British situation was. And in would stalk this tall, importunate statesman asking for more of this, that France be represented, that France do this, that France be included in, in various small operations we've all forgotten about now, but which he thought was essential for the revival of France as a power, and because he identified France with himself, his own power. June 18, 1940, the date of de Gaulle's historic appeal was his moment of destiny. No longer an obscure officer concerning himself with military tactics, he became the leader of a new France. His resources were pitiful. Some 7,000 soldiers who had been evacuated to Britain and chose to remain, and a few warships operating under British command. Only a handful of civilians recognized his qualities. He had nothing to sustain him but his own force of character and his unquenchable love of France. But on the basis of his previous position in the French government, he assumed authority over French officers who were far his senior in military rank. His courage and tenacity of purpose where France was concerned won him the respect of Winston Churchill. But France possessed a colonial empire which, in North Africa and the Near East, was of great strategic importance. Would this empire follow the Vichy government in mutual collaboration with Germany? Or could de Gaulle win its loyalty for his free France? Some of the best ships in France's powerful fleet lay in Algerian waters. The risk of these warships falling into German hands was too great. Despite de Gaulle, Churchill ordered the Royal Navy to sink them. De Gaulle could understand the destruction of the French fleet. This was a, a strategic question. He understood. The problem, from De Gaulle's standpoint, got worse when the United States came in. De Gaulle's attitude towards Roosevelt was compounded of fear and, I suppose, respect. I think he feared, and rightly as it turned out, that Roosevelt, being at the start anti-Gaulliste, would raise some new French leader as a rival to De Gaulle in the hopes that this would make de Gaulle more tractable, easier to handle. In the event, of course, it did not. It made him more intransigent. When the Allies landed in North Africa late in 42, this rival to de Gaulle appeared, General Giraud. Roosevelt's choice as Allied Commander-in-Chief was General Eisenhower. To him fell the problems of handling an alliance in which the political ramifications often seemed to override military considerations. The Americans backed General Giraud, 
and de Gaulle's claim to be the leader of all free France was tested as never before. Giraud was a good soldier, but no politician, while de Gaulle now had two years' experience in the art of statesmanship. The battle in North Africa was being fought over territory which the French claimed as their own. With each military victory came fresh political complications. Whom should the Allies deal with? The French administration on the spot, appointed by the Vichy regime, or de Gaulle's nominees? In the struggle for power, de Gaulle drew on the loyalty of the team of men who gathered around him during his first days in London. Gaullism, as it began to be called, was by now closely associated with the spirit of free France and with a symbol de Gaulle had chosen for his stand, the Cross of Lorraine. Giraud's position was steadily undermined by de Gaulle's men. Throughout the war, de Gaulle had to contend with the most powerful figures in the Western Alliance. Early in 43, Churchill and Roosevelt met at Casablanca with their top military advisors. De Gaulle and Giraud were both summoned to the conference and publicly shook hands. But soon after, Giraud dropped into the background. It was here that de Gaulle met Roosevelt for the first time. I don't believe that the two men got along at all well together. For one thing, it was Roosevelt's belief that he spoke French very well, which was not justified. And they'd say something and then an interpreter would have to be brought in to, go to explain to each what the nitty gritty problems were. There was also the fact that Roosevelt, even more than Churchill, was a supremely confident man. And he thought, with reason, that he had more popular support than any American president had ever had. For de Gaulle, this was a stone wall. As Allied victories in the desert continued, Roosevelt tried to get Churchill to break with de Gaulle. But Churchill refused to dump the one Frenchman who had defied Hitler before the Americans had entered the war. De Gaulle then learned that the Americans and British were not intending to allow the free French to take part in the liberation of Tunisia and Libya. De Gaulle bluntly informed Eisenhower that if this were the case, he would pull out his own free French troops and send them to the Soviet Union to fight alongside the Red Army. Thanks to De Gaulle, France had earned the right to march with the victors in the great struggle against tyranny. Inside occupied France, de Gaulle's name was synonymous with resistance. Broadcasts from Britain had made his voice familiar throughout his homeland. Last the day came when de Gaulle headed back for France, following the Allied landings in Normandy. But when he first set foot again on his native soil, it was in the humiliating knowledge that his free French forces had been left out of the invasion plans for security reasons. He himself was not even entrusted with detailed information about the landings. The wound went deep and lasted long. In later years, he cultivated the idea that France had freed herself, which was true only in the sense of his own moral victories. Though they distinguished themselves in the fighting, neither the French units in the field nor the partisans contributed as much to the Allied cause as the Gaullists liked to claim. One by one, the cities of France were liberated by the Allied armies, and de Gaulle was close at hand to receive the people's welcome. Back on French soil at last, he could assert his own authority as the sole leader of France, independent of British or American patronage. No one could doubt any longer that the honor and destiny of his country rested on his shoulders. In August 1944, Paris was freed. Released from four years of enemy occupation, the whole city, it seemed, poured into the streets to welcome back de Gaulle. 
De Gaulle marched with all the dignitaries of the new and the old France. A sniping broke out. Everybody knew there was some uh, ex pétainistes and German deserters in Paris. De Gaulle marched through that as though he were going through an April shower. Everybody else, bishops, generals, politicians, fell on their bellies. Not De Gaulle. He marched straight through it. It was, I think, a singular example of his own self-confidence that he did not feel that anyone, any sniper, any rifleman, could really hit him. He was France, and this was one of the things, I'm sure, that carried him through on that day. The victors were cheered in Paris, but de Gaulle knew the fickle nature of French crowds, especially those of the capital. The communists had been a strong force in French society before the war. After Germany's attack on Russia, they had played an increasing part in the resistance movement. Victory celebrations enabled them to pay off many old scores against their political enemies, and they represented a serious threat to de Gaulle's authority. De Gaulle claimed to represent France and to be the only legitimate source of power in the state. With nothing but his own force of character, he had challenged the legally appointed Vichy government headed by Marshal Pétain. The position needed clarifying. In the autumn of 1944, de Gaulle announced the establishment of a provisional French government headed by himself, which Britain and America soon formally recognized. The position of France also needed clarifying. De Gaulle had always insisted that France should be treated as an equal in the alliance, and that the territorial integrity of the French Empire should be preserved. He was suspicious of Roosevelt, though responsive to the warmth of the American people, when he visited New York and met Mayor LaGuardia. You, John de Gaulle, who stood by from the very beginning, who we know will stand by to the very end. Viva la France! Viva la Exceptionally good and grateful reception. Good luck to you all in the world. And after the war in the peace, good luck to you soldiers, good luck to you all, men and women, working for the democracy, for the liberty, for the victory. Good luck to you. Bravo! De Gaulle went on to Washington for talks with Roosevelt. But the American president failed to satisfy de Gaulle that France had an appropriate role in allied plans for a future United Nations. Angered by this renewed slight to his country, de Gaulle went next to Moscow to seek an alliance with the Soviet Union. The treaty he obtained meant little in practical terms. Although de Gaulle showed that France, under his leadership, was capable of taking her own independent line in world affairs. The importance of the visit lay rather in de Gaulle's realistic assessment of the Soviet threat to Western Europe. When peace at last came to Europe, France was left to sort out her own political future. People longed for a return to normalcy. To de Gaulle's disgust, the old pre-war parties returned as though nothing had happened in the interval. They brought with them the political intrigues which de Gaulle believed had fatally weakened France when Germany attacked in 1940. Refusing to have any part in this system, de Gaulle retired from the scene in January 1946 to hold himself ready, he believed, for a return to power on his own terms. He had no wish, as he put it, to preside powerless over the powerlessness of the state. For a time, de Gaulle fought for his ideas for a reformed France. 
he headed a new party called the Rally of the French People. It would be a party above parties, he said. Enthousiastes, nous voici réunis. Pourquoi? Est-ce pour caresser des intérêts? Est-ce pour exciter des haines? Est-ce pour remâcher des angoisses? Non. Il n'y a pas un ici qui ne sache que nous y sommes pour la seule cause de la France. Dans l'histoire de la France, qui sait des plus grandes gloires et des plus grandes douleurs, les Vosges viennent une fois de plus d'offrir à la patrie. De Gaulle constantly warned his fellow countrymen of the new dangers which beset them in a world dominated by the superpowers of Russia and America. But though large numbers attended his meetings, his speeches made little impression on French politics. Instead, with their openly nationalist appeal and authoritarian ring, they gave men cause to question the wisdom of ever letting him hold power again. This party soon disappeared. The cross of Lorraine, it seemed, was a thing of the past, and the day of Charles de Gaulle over for good. I think he retired because he felt there was nothing more he could do. And he was exasperated with this, what he called the melange of, of uh, French politics, the proliferation of parties, and also because he thought in time they would turn to him again. So he retired to Colombie. He lived there, he wrote his memoirs, and he was waiting in the wings for the call, which did not come for 12 long years, in which time France's position in the world became progressively lower. But de Gaulle had the force of character to wait until the time came to act again.